What exactly are gradient removal tools doing behind the scenes? In some ways, it's quite sophisticated, and in other ways, it's pretty simple. Fundamentally, they are taking samples of the image, and tools like dynamic background extraction, you might specify where those sample points go. In tools like Graxpert, the AI might do it. They use that to estimate the nature of the background and create a model for extraction. Often you need to help these tools realize what's the unwanted background. Like in DBE, that happens when you set your sample points, though Graxpert's AI is really, really good at figuring that out. And they take those samples and they use that to construct a background model, something I think I'm a little notorious for calling a counterplate, because the background model is an image of what has to be countered, in other words, negated, to effectively extract the background or gradient. Now, as far as the gradient extraction tool is concerned, you don't actually have to produce an image of the background model. If you make an image of the gradient, we see it visually, but as far as the gradient extraction tool or the background extraction tool is concerned, it's just math. The background extraction tools don't know what is the information you want saved versus what is actually structure or desired signal. They simply composite the background model back into the image in an attempt to divide and or subtract out unwanted information. We can test and observe this by using the generated image of the background models. Let's start with DBE. In DBE, we have two compositing strategies to choose from, division and subtraction. Each has a somewhat different role, but we're gonna work with just subtraction today, just to keep things simple and to try to keep this video relatively brief. So what I've done here is I've gone back to the image of the Bodes and Cigar Galaxy, back from the first and second videos. You're probably tired of looking at it right now, but it remains a good example since it had such a terrible gradient and some other problems, those dust spots that we'll look at in an entirely different video. Anyway, I've put it in Pix Insight again. Now for the sake of thoroughness, I'm going to run this test two ways. I really have to do that to try to compare apples to apples in so much as possible, because Affinity Photo doesn't have anything like a screen transfer function, and we'll need to be able to see the images that we're working with in Affinity Photo. So I've run this test one time around using DBE on an image after I have already run a spectrophotometric color calibration and then a histogram transformation. I'm aware there is some discussion and debate about the right order to run DBE or dynamic background extraction versus SPCC or spectrophotometric color calibration. However, for my part, I feel that the most cogent argument suggests that the right order is to run SPCC and then if necessary, DBE. There is a link to a great discussion in the description. But I think with all the discussion and disagreement, it probably depends on the situation. And it helps here because we need to extract the green to see what DBE is doing to the image. So in the first case, I color corrected with spectrophotometric color calibration, then ran a histogram stretch on it, then DBE. Then I reran the entire series by running SPCC, then DBE before the histogram transformation. The goal is to keep the comparison fair and balanced, uh, mainly because PixInsight and Affinity Photo are each going to handle color and luminance and how they handle their subtraction composites a bit differently. So I want to look at the images both ways to get a sense of the differences between how both applications will handle color and light. All right, let's first take a look at the outcomes from having run a histogram transformation first and then dynamic background extraction. What I'm going to do now is use a strategy devised a year or two ago by Visible Dark, who is a brilliant fellow with a brilliant channel on all types of astrophotography strategies and applications. And he came up with this really elegant, powerful way to run DBE in many circumstances. There's always going to be an exception where a technique doesn't work, but this one is often good. Applying his strategy, I'm going to set the tolerance to 2 and the shadows relaxation to 6. Increasing the tolerance allows for more permissive background estimations. It can lead to errors, but most of the time seems to make things work smoothly. And increasing the shadows relaxation allows for more dark pixels in the generated background model. Then I'm going to set the default sample radius to 150, giving us nice large square boxes to take lots of samples of the space around our galaxies. As Visible Dark pointed out, it seems to be just fine if there's the odd small star in them. You'd want to avoid big bright things. And Visible Dark recommended running division first to help eliminate halos and then subtraction to run our subtraction composite, which deducts the generated model from the image. To keep things simple here, we're going to skip the division composite part. There are a few, if any, halos to deal with here, and it would just otherwise overcomplicate this video. Finally, I'm going to keep the background model and not let DBE discard the original image. Let's run it. 
When it's done, we're going to get a plate of the background model, which DBE has supplied to composite by subtraction what it believes, based on the information that we have allowed it, is the unwanted background. That's the background model there. Now, YouTube compression tends to do awful things with things in dim luminosity. Maybe you can see it, just like in the original image with the terrible gradient, it's red on the left and green on the right, and leans more toward properly dark toward the middle. So, in this background model, we get the same thing. We get a model that portrays red on the left, green on the right, and dark toward the top. When DBE applies the subtraction composite, this model tells DBE to subtract that much red out of the left and that much green out of the right, but leave the blacks toward the top alone. When DBE subtraction formula, or composite, is applied to the original image, we get this. It's a workable image by and large, not my preference for a workable image, but definitely workable. Now, to get everything looking as good as possible, I'm just going to run Blur Exterminator and Noise Exterminator, both on the original image and the DBE output image. It's not going to make any difference really in how the background model affects the plate, but it might help show how pretty the outcomes can be with a little bit of work. And we'll take a look at outcomes without the exterminators in the second run. So I'm pulling these images as layers into my favorite non-destructive layer-based photo editor, Affinity Photo. And what we want to see if we can do here is take that background model and simply composite it over our image with the gradient and get a similar outcome in Affinity Photo. They have some differences, so it won't be exactly the same, but let's watch the outcome. With the background model selected, we'll go up to the composite menu and select the subtraction composite mode. And you are probably immediately and correctly thinking it's over dark. Well, yeah, sort of, it's over contrasted. And the reason for that is, while this is also a subtraction composite mode, Affinity Photo defaults to heavier on the contrast. Let's put a contrast tool in the counterplate or DBE's background model and really crank down the contrast and see what happens. Now we have an outcome that is very similar to what DBE did. Let's compare it directly to the DBE outcome. Here, I've used Irvin View to open up the DBE outcome and locked it to the top of the desktop so that we can see it on the right, and we can see Affinity Photo's outcome on the left. There are still some slight differences, but not that much. Affinity Photo applies harder contrast in its subtraction composite than DBE does when it activates its subtraction composite. But when the contrast was lifted out of the way Affinity Photo applied its subtraction composite, we get a result that's almost the exact same thing. This is because the way the DBE tool works is it creates a luminosity and hue-based model, or counterplate, to counter or subtract out that luminosity and hue from the original image, which may have the gradient or background that we might want to remove. Compositing tells the layer above to act in some way mathematically on the lower layer, and will enhance, subtract, or ignore information based on the chosen composite formula. And the subtraction composite mode uses the layer above, the background model, as a guide to determine what to subtract out of the layer below. So the hue and luminosity in the image layer that match the background model are removed. Now let's see if it makes any real difference if we do this without a histogram stretch. Once again, we'll start off by running spectrophotometric color calibration, but this time I will not do a histogram stretch, at least not yet. Then I'll evoke the dynamic background extractor and run the extraction in the exact same way. We again end up with a background model along with our corrected image of the boats and cigar galaxies. And we still have our original image in the background with its terrible gradient. Now I'll run the histogram stretch and then save them and we'll drag them into Affinity Photo. The corrected version, that is the version with the gradients extracted is our bottom layer so that we can peek at it as we go along. The middle layer is our version of the galaxies without the background extracted that we'll be operating the composites on from the background model, the, the counterplate, up at the very top. And you can see that I've already applied the subtraction composite from Affinity Photo onto the counterplate. Now, just like before, I'm going to go over to the Brightness and Contrast tool, evoke it, make sure that it is in the background model or counterplate so it only affects that plate, and turn the contrast all the way down. Once again, we get an outcome that's very similar. The background model has simply been composited onto the lower layer by way of subtraction, removing the hues and luminosity that was indicated by the background model or counterplate. The only real difference is, is having run the histogram after, 
we end up with a finished product that's a bit darker than the dynamic background extraction outcome. You can see right there, I've turned on the dynamic background extraction outcome. It's brighter and much lower in contrast this time. But since this is non-destructive editing, that's easy to change. I can further reduce the contrast and increase the brightness if I want in the layer of the Boats and Cigar Galaxies that has the layer on it. And that's the beauty of non-destructive processing. All the original data is always there so that we can bring out or suppress it however we want at any time. Now, let's take a quick look at Graxbert. I've opened the original image in PixInsight, then I'm going to go over to the scripts, select the toolbox, and run Graxbert within Affinity Photo. I've also selected the option telling Graxbert to show us the background model that it uses. Graxbert will run and produce a model exactly like DBE does, and it uses this model to apply a composite to what we have indicated to it, or its AI has told it, is unwanted gradients or background. And there's our Graxpert outcome image, and right behind it is the background model. Graxpert simply used this background model to composite out what it believes or we have indicated to it is unwanted gradient or background. It doesn't exactly know what to keep or avoid, it simply composites out what its AI or the user has indicated is unwanted information. Anyway, this is how the gradient tools are operating. That's the magic, or the formulae, or the compositing methods, or however you choose to term it. This is what they do. They don't know what is desired signal versus undesired gradients or noise. They aren't capable of intelligently knowing what to cancel out and what to leave behind, especially in subtler values. They simply create a background model, estimating the luminance and hues that you don't want in the image, either based on the information that you define, or if using something like Graxpert, allowing its AI to make that estimation for you, and apply a compositing method in an attempt to subtract out the unwanted information. I think, though I'm not sure, that their subtraction composites tend to be lower contrast than what you would see in Affinity Photo, because Affinity Photo isn't trying to retain very subtle astrophotography information. It's very adaptable to astrophotography, but it's more of a universal editor. Whereas the gradient removal tools are trying to retain very subtle information. And if they contrasted harder, it would look like some information was being lost. Though if they were working with the information non-destructively, meaning if they left the core information in, like you get with non-destructive layer-based photo editors, that would not be an issue. There is sort of a workaround to that. When running one of those gradient removal tools, you can tell it to leave the original image. And then, if you take your processing outside of PixInsight and go into a layer-based photo editor, you have that original image there as a source from which you can pull whatever information you want into your image as you go about your developing. Well, I hope that helps. If you think I'm not so you see any errors, please let me know. I'm not a mathematician. I'm just going by my observations of how I see these processes working. So I hope that helps, and I hope you have fun with astrophotography, and, well, just get out there and shoot that sky.